Welcome everybody. We've got James Barrett here today um, and I've done an interview in the past with James Barrett in 2013 on his book Our Final Invention. We're going to be revisiting the topic of AI friendliness or AI safety um, but just by way of introductions James has been has been a prolific documentary f uh, filmmaker and is also a speaker and author. He's been involved in large broadcasters like National Geographic, PBS, Nova, BBC and the Discovery Channel and, and recently in PBS that he did a, a documentary a couple of years ago before the pandemic hit on zoonotic diseases. So look, it's really topical. So thanks very much for joining us again, James. How you been? It's, I'm doing great. It's a pleasure to be here, Adam. Thank you for inviting me again. Absolutely. It's, a, it's always a great t opportunity to talk to you. And I, I love talking about these topics anyway. But um, tell me about this zoonotic documentary you did recently. Well, it was a couple of years ago, but they've been playing it on PBS a lot because it's germane to COVID-19. It's uh, It was called Spillover, Zika, Ebola and Beyond. And uh, we started out to make a film about Ebola and we went to West Africa during the uh, end of the crisis. And then Zika came out. So I went to we went to Brazil to to cover that story as well. So it ended up covering Zika, Ebola and uh, some other diseases. And th these are all diseases that jump from the animal kingdom to to humans, very much like COVID-19. Um, and, you know, one thing that, that struck me when we were making that film was that everyone I interviewed, I interviewed a lot of people at, at the CDC and, and people at uh, the National Institute of uh, Health's Infectious Diseases Unit, and they were very, very uh, confident that nothing, nothing like Ebola or Zika or any other uh, very virulent virus could catch on here because our medical system is so sophisticated. And it's, it's uh, very ironic that, that COVID right now is just kicking our butts and we, we seem to be helpless against it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yes, as, uh, we can certainly be very arrogant. Maybe people just don't think AI will be a problem. And I, I'm worried that we're going to be blindsided with some of the, the problems that you introduce in your book, uh, Our Final Invention. For those who haven't actually been introduced to the book, do you want to give us a, just a, a brief introduction to what the book is and why you wrote it? Sure. Um, the book is about the long and short term impacts of AI, uh, none of which could could be very good. I was I was at the time I was. Um, I started my my interest in AI by reading a lot of Ray, by reading Ray Kurzweil and 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 a lot of other people about about AI and the, the the books that were on the market at the time around 2010 when I started writing were all very rosy and AI was was this this great thing and I I've been following AI since about 2000 and um, I was also bitten by the AI bug and pretty much um, euphoric about the the potential for AI. But then uh, I interviewed Arthur C. Clarke around that time, a little bit earlier than that. And uh, yes, it was a, I, I interviewed him around 2001. And he hmm. said, um, he said, to, to pop my euphoria, he said something like, uh, we humans steer the future not because we're the fastest or the strongest creatures, but because we're the most intelligent. When we share the planet with something more intelligent than we are, they will steer the future. So uh that that stuck with me and uh kind of uh, that 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 idea never went away and i started talking to ai experts and ai makers about um what i used to call the two minute problem and it was when i listened to an ai lecture in the final two minutes the the expert would say well and by the way there is a chance ai could get out of control and you know could really could really do a lot of damage and then they'd go back to the good news so when I investigated the bad news, it was pretty bad, uh, including wiping out the human race. But it started mm -hmm. with it, it starts with smaller things. We can see those smaller things now and we can get into them. Um, it starts right now. We've got we've got issues with AI. And I'm not I'm I'm generally a proponent of AI. I, I, I think it's got terrific potential. It's being used to, you know, very well in medicine right now, very well in, in, in radiology. Um, uh, diagnostics, it's business analytics. Uh, it's solving a lot of problems, and it has a huge future in in medical issues. But mm -hmm. at the same time, it's a dual use technology, capable of great good and great harm. And we've got problems with uh, 
you know, I can go into these now or later, but you've got problems like like bias in the data. Mm-hmm. Which, uh, we've got we've got issues with uh, with algorithms not um, the data that the algorithms were created with don't represent minorities. So you have minorities and women who can't get who who don't uh, get jobs at this at the same rate as as men. Uh, in the UK, there was an algorithm that wasn't that was for for college admission that was biased against minorities and women. Wow. Um, in America, there are a lot of sentencing guideline algorithms that were based on data taken from the 70s, 80s, and 90s, where as a matter of course, minorities had longer prison sentences. They just mm-hmm. got them. It was uh, it was just plain old racism. But with with uh, with data, data always brings values with it. And um, so now in, in the modern day, they were using these sentencing algorithms that were that were pre- that were prejudiced and gave gave people of color longer prison sentences. So there's a lot there are a lot of before you get to the big existential risk of AI, there are a lot of smaller problems along the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And look, um, just to set the stage, uh, there's been quite a bit of development in AI since last we spoke in 2013. Mm-hmm. I think it was like almost Christmas in 2013. Um, and a few of the developments have really shown the power of deep learning. Very powerful, extremely powerful. I mean, we've got GPT-3, we've got, um, of course, the, the, the winds, like AlphaGo, we've got AlphaStar, more recently AlphaFold, which is, you know, solves uh, yeah. with, um, some scientific problems. I say solved reservedly. Um, of course, it doesn't understand what it's doing. It's all, all it's really doing is just predicting protein folding to a very, um, I guess, astonishing degree of accuracy. Yeah. And that's great, yeah, but this is a this is a problem, mate. Do you think has your mindset changed, and ha- has the public mindset changed about the uh, potential for AI now um, than than what is what what it was in the past, like seven I years think, ago? Yeah, I think um, we couldn't have anticipated a lot of things seven years ago. The folding problem, I remember people talking about it as being one of those unsolvable problems where uh, basically uh, how to determine a, a, a protein's 3D shape from its amino acid sequence. Humans can, haven't been able to do it. Now G, uh, AlphaFold has. Um, GPT-2 is, is really impressive as a language modeling uh, s- software that basically anticipates what, what's coming next. We couldn't anticipate then, you know, what's, what, what's coming next? What's the next word? Going to mm-hmm. be, um, and that's how it strings together a whole lot of words and ultimately loses meaning because it doesn't really understand anything. Hmm. Um, the what we couldn't, I couldn't anticipate was how much money would was going to AI. <laughs> uh, it's the amount, of, it's it's exponential growth in the investment. The amount has doubled every year since two thousand nine. Right wow. now, it's about thirty thirty billion dollars, which doesn't seem like a lot, but uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers. Anticipates that by 2030, um, AI will add 16 trillion dollars to the global GDP, making it, you know, one of the largest, if not the largest, part of the economy. That same year, uh, says Gartner and Company, half of all jobs will be lost to AI. Is this so, Gartner and McKinsey are saying this? Wow. This is not. No, this is the Gartner and Company. Uh, yeah. Price Waterhouse okay. Coopers was the first one. I mean, I, I, McKinsey is probably on board with these guys, but I don't know. Yeah. 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 Wow, that's incredible. Half jobs by 2030. Is that existing jobs or is that all jobs? Um, you, do you think that like half of these jobs that we will lose to AI will be replaced by new jobs? Or do you think that there will no, just I think be that's a paucity of jobs in the future? I think there'll be a paucity of jobs. I mean, any job, when I, when I talk to students, I tell them, don't, don't take jobs that, that computers can do. Don't do anything that involves routine or rote memory or doing the same thing again and again uh, don't do you know look at look at all look at the kinds of jobs that are going away all factory jobs will be gone um, uh, all driving jobs but in, in not too much time will be gone all postal jobs are virtually virtually already gone anything that requires 
repetition, but that goes up into the into not just working class, but into uh, into not just blue collar, but white collar. Um, a lot of legal jobs are going to go away. Legal discovery, the, what first year law associates do, because it's really just research, and 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 uh, computers can do that a lot. Of, Simple research better than we can. Hmm. Yeah, radiology, medicine, um, all 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 sectors are going to get hit. Now the 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 it's been true it's been true in the past that new technologies do not yield a net uh, loss of jobs. This is different though because it's because it's cognitive because it requires it's a it's a it's a thinking technology. It's not like uh, a cotton gin or uh, an assembly line. Um, and so it goes deeper into into more strata of the economy, and um, <clears throat> it's very unclear to me. People say, "Well, <clears throat> we'll retrain these low-skilled workers. We'll retrain them for other jobs. We'll make them uh, we'll make them program. We'll get them to be programmers, or we'll make them into robot repairmen." Well, if you took an assembly line full of people, you might get a couple of managers out of that. You might get a couple of people who retrain up, but mm. people who are who are working on an assembly line and people who are driving cars are doing that because they don't have a lot of other skills. And the idea that they could they 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 could be trained for more advanced skills that the robots haven't take haven't taken is kind of a myth. Um, mm. It's hard to anticipate the new industries that will be born from AI. There'll be things we can't imagine right now, but. I think it's highly unlikely that there'll be jobs for all those people that the AI and automation will displace. <clears throat> Indeed, they, they, this is this is a scary future for a lot of people. I mean, when there's a lot of desperate people around, people will do desperate things. Um, we're finding and, that, we're, yeah, we're finding that right now in the United States, we're having riots, mm. and uh, we have you know mass unemployment because of the of the virus. And we have people who are just, 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 you know, as they say, losing their religion over uh, job loss, over the the idea of uh, government getting bigger and more powerful during this during this pandemic. Hmm. Um, and we've we've also got a leader who's just batshit crazy, and mm -hmm. isn't isn't uh, is inciting violence. Mm -hmm. Which is a, a difficult thing, um, and it's one of the themes that uh, I've sort of interviewed others about is the degree to which people trust experts now because they've got this source of alternative facts, this post-truthness, <clears throat> um, where, where people are finding it very difficult or this it's just strange to tell the difference between like what, what can be, what should be able to be given like strong credence and what shouldn't, you know, who to trust. It's this lack of trust mm -hmm. in, in, in the world, and especially in America, I imagine, um, at the moment, which is a, a, a difficult problem to navigate. How can you convince people where you can't actually share a mutual ground on which to make, which to adjudicate yes, the, you can't the, the truthfulness on, of yeah. claims made and, 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 and the realities before us? It's crazy. We've, we've, we've got a, uh, a president who doesn't, doesn't trust science, probably because he never took a science course or never took a you know test that he didn't sh didn't cheat on or have somebody else take but he just does not trust science he does not read um, he's 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 studiously ignorant about the world around him he's, he's the least curious person in the country um, he doesn't trust his scientists he's got a, he had a team of the best scientists in the country epidemiologists um, I, I remember interviewing Anthony Fauci years ago and he was even then just you know the, the best Epidemiologist or person who studies ep epidemics in the you know in, in our country anyway, <clears throat> um, and he's he, he's not trusted. And the whole the whole way that this uh, the whole way that this COVID response has been treated is is because of as you said this distrust of science, this distrust of facts that there's alternate facts. Um, it's it's absolutely absurd. It's a real it's like it's like the Enlightenment never happened. Where it's a step back into ignorance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate, um, but I mean, yeah. So if if we have this public distrust of of facts and science, I mean, it's going to be even more difficult to um, talk about this issue of AI friendliness 
I mean, if people just oh, want yeah. the, the most comfortable explanation, the, the, the explanation which provides them the, the most sort of security or, you know, the vision for the future, which is they, the they, most exactly, utopian. They, yes, they, they want comfort and they want to be told everything's going to be okay. Or they want uh, enemies pointed out. I mean, hmm. that's what they really like. What it seems to be, uh, you know, half of our population in the United States want. What they want are scapegoats and people to blame things on. Hmm. Um, I used to. I, I, I mean, I wrote our final invention in, in as simple uh, a, a language, as simple language as I could muster, in order to get it out to the most people and to make hmm. even non scientifically based people understand but which i'm wondering now if that was a waste of time because you know i think that the the um part of the audience i was trying to reach doesn't read anyway and just mm -hmm. and would it wouldn't embrace uh, a science book what's well, the problem in in um i guess science communication uh in general um and that is people are low ration are low information um rational rational agents i guess they we don't execute yeah. on huge amounts of information like ai might <laughs> in the future yeah but um yeah. yeah so so it's very difficult people well, often have it, very strong opinions especially about the opinions uh, things which i know least about <laughs> yes least yes that's, that's... <laughs> there was something called rational agent economic theory and it was designed to uh, anticipate what markets would do based on rational decisions that we make buying and selling and economists pushed it as a way to sort of normalize markets, but hmm. it didn't work because we're not rational. We impulse buy, we buy things we don't need, we don't buy things we do need. And so the idea that we're, we're rational agents is, is kind of a big mistake. What we are is impulsive and very emotional. And we, de hmm. we develop attachments to things that are absolutely terrible for us. Um, and that's why, you know, I think part of Part of the uh, hype about AI has been, uh, you know, a giant spoonful of sugar. I, I think Ray Kurzweil is a great inventor, a great prognosticator about the future, but he's he's been part of the the selling machine to to make AI seem safe and, and lovely. Um, but I think, you know, I, I I'd have to say on the encouraging side, we've seen AI safety grow as a as a, oh. as a topic. We've seen AI That's every. I, I'm, I'm stunned at how many organizations have popped up that are discussing AI safety and AI ethics, you know, mm -hmm. Future of Life Institute, Future of Humanities Institute, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, and a bunch of new Cambridge faces that you Center can't keep up with them. Existential risk, yeah. Heaps of yeah, them. You can't, a yeah, lot exactly. <laughs> There's a lot. And I, that, well, I find... Catastrophics Risk Institute with uh, Seth Baum. Yes, yeah, Seth Baum, yeah. yeah. We should have one in Australia. You should. You, there you yeah. go. There's your, there's your, your side <laughs> career. Anybody yeah, needs a, a right academic board. context, yeah. And, and they come out with these voluminous uh, treatments of, um, of AI ethics. Uh, some of them aren't voluminous, and those are actually the best ones, because I, don't, I think that we've, we don't need principles. We need uh, regulatory bodies that can go and look at whatever AI you're building. Hmm. Just like we have, uh, you know, I, I've said this forever, um, we have an IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, for looking into silos and looking into reactors and making sure that people are are conforming to international uh, protocols. And if they're not, they get they get um, they get uh, censure. They get uh, they get um, steps taken against them. They get tariffs. They get all kinds of bad things that happen to them. Which what it's happened to uh, in the recent past. It's happened a lot to Iran. Um, we need that for AI. Uh, mm. We need we need those sorts of boots on the ground, people looking in, into labs. I, I'm, I'm usually the, I would be the last one to say we need any kind of government regulation because it's generally inefficient. Mm. But in this case, we need government regulation because the companies that are building the AI just, just cannot be trusted on their own. Mm -hmm. They just mm. simply can't be trusted. They all have a we we can go into that. Uh, yeah, what did you say? I think in another country. interview, like uh, you brought out a really interesting factoid, and that is uh, about Cambridge Analytica, and how it it, it, it took a lot of oh, data sure. well, from okay, so uh, Facebook uh, allowed that, right? We have we had there's there's a concept uh, you're familiar with, I, I know, called the intelligence explosion. Yep. 
and you can see the parts of it assembling around us. Um, and, and it goes like this. And this is brought up by I.J. Good in the 1960s. He could see it. He could see the potential for it. And interestingly, in the in, here's some trivia. He was he was evaluating an art one of the first artificial neural nets at the time. Hmm. It was ca called the uh, perceptron. Yep. And it was it was a it was one layer. Uh, and it didn't it didn't do much, but it did a little bit. But unfortunately, Roger Rosenblatt, uh, who invented it, died in a boating accident. Hmm. And then Marvin Minsky wrote a book saying, "Oh, artificial neural nets will never work." Yeah. yeah. And it killed him. And they they were they were happening in the '60s. They, we could we could have been far ahead right now. But anyway, um, the whole idea behind just to build up to this, one of the things that's working so well for us right now is. Um, some some AI makers in around 2009, uh, Jeffrey Hinton, mm -hmm. um, Stuart like Russell, to name two. There's there's yeah there's another there's another one another a third one whose name I, I forget. But they had the insight that if you take a, you take a lot of data, feed it to a, a simple learning algorithm, you'll get superhuman uh, pattern recognition capabilities and, and, and prognostication, guessing what's going to happen next capabilities, which yes, is great exactly what's happening with exactly what's happening with uh, GPT-2. Right. And uh, then, then the more the more layers that you may take a simple learning algorithm and then take another simple learning algorithm and another one, then you get deep learning and you get really, really powerful capabilities. Um, that led to a uh, to uh, machines doing a lot of things that we used to be able to do uh, that were just solely in the in, in the purview of humans, and now it does AI does great translation, great navigation, great. It's going to soon do great driving. It a lot of the things that it's, that it's doing right now is owed to this this insight. Mm -hmm. So, to apply the intelligence explosion to this, we're creating machines that do a lot of what we do, but they do it better. At a point, and we've just solved one of them has just solved the po protein folding problem, which incredible. nobody thought was going to happen for a long, long time. Just like they never thought the game Go would be defeated, but mm -hmm. but AlphaGo and AlphaGo Zero defeated it several mm -hmm. years ago. Now that mm -hmm. was supposed to take 30 years. Um, so we've created a lot of machine. We've created machines that do a lot of things better than us. In the not too distant future, we'll create machines that that do. Uh, artificial intelligence research and development better than we do. And then the machines, according to IJ Good, will set the pace of intelligence expansion, not humans. And mm -hmm. then suddenly, we'll be sharing the planet with something that's a thousand or millions of million times more intelligent than we are. We don't mm -hmm. really know what the ceiling of intelligence is. We, mm -hmm. we know that the ceiling of human intelligence is, is, is not awfully high. But we don't know what, what hypothetically, what, what the ceiling is for, for, uh, for um, for AI, uh, there may be no ceiling. So we're 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 building all, we're putting all the building blocks in place for this uh, for the intelligence explosion. Yet we don't really know, and this is this is the problem. This is the uh, this is uh, the control problem. This is the alignment problem. We don't know how to how to live with something that's a thousand or millions of times more intelligent than we are. As as Stephen Hawking said, we won't. It will create weapons we don't even understand. Um, it will outsmart our canniest politicians, which is kind of a low bar, but that's, it will it'll it'll be uh, intelligent in dimensions that we that we don't we just don't grasp. <clears throat> now that that's all pretty pretty terrifying. But now look at who's in charge of the intelligence explosion. Demis Hassabis was one of the co-founders of DeepMind, and a couple of years ago, he said, "I don't trust the AI makers to monitor and control." The uh, intelligence explosion to mitigate it before we hit that that time yeah, when we, we, we're yeah. suddenly you know when we're suddenly sharing the planet with something that's far more intelligent than we are. Um, and and why would he say that? He say that because the, all the candidates are morally pretty crappy. Um, I you know it's it, it's and some of it's just truly astounding as everybody knows or should know. Um, in 2016, Facebook gave the the private data of 80 million Americans to Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica gave it to Russians. Together, they, they um, targeted a lot of American voters in for, to, to influence them in the 2016 election. We don't know how great their influence was. You'd have to look into the heads of all those people. And that, so um, right after, and, and while uh, uh, 
while Mark Zuckerberg was was apologizing to Congress, they were giving the same data to the to the Chinese government. So yeah, and they had incredible. they still haven't learned. Right now they were just Apple and Facebook were just caught uh, colluding about uh, measures taken against them in antitrust in an upcoming antitrust suit. Um, Apple, you know, so so Facebook. Would you trust Facebook with this technology? Well, I wouldn't. Google has has 400 lawyers for, among other reasons, they've been sued in 20 countries for everything from privacy violations to predatory business practices to to, uh, to intellectual uh, property theft. Um, I wouldn't trust them with this technology either. I wouldn't trust them with the, to mitigate the intelligence explosion because we know where their values are. Their values aren't with safety and fairness. Their values are in the bot in the bottom line. Um, Apple's Apple's in the same boat. Apple's uh, they came out recently and said, "Oh, we're so shocked that one of our one of our suppliers of iPhone parts uh, or iPad parts, one of our suppliers, was using child labor. What they were doing was using uh, they, they had student interns that were su supposed to be paid were not being paid and basically kept in slave quarters. Um, a few years before that, uh, Apple turned turned a blind eye to Foxconn. Foxconn's the largest industrial contract manufacturer." Uh, Foxconn had a, a series of suicides because their working conditions were so crappy. Um, Apple expressed expressed dismay. Foxconn stopped reporting suicides, and then the whole thing, went, the whole problem went away. So this coterie of of tech companies, I'm leaving I'm leaving some out. Um, if you were going to pick companies to monitor the most sensitive and dangerous moment in our in human history. The intelligence explosion. If you're going to pick companies, they wouldn't be these companies. We we can't trust them with with the intelligence explosion, which is what one of many reasons why why uh, supervision and regulation is necessary. Hmm. Now, <laughs> so you you may I got on I got up on my soapbox just then, so I'll try to that's fine climb down. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um. Look, I, 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 I'm a bit stunned. Uh, look, when I hear this sort of information, it, it is, um, it's, it's nerve-wracking. Can I say the least? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's like you're driving. Yeah, you're driving in a car, and four of the five people driving are drunk, and you know you don't, you, you, you're, you're not allowed to get. You know, you, you want to get behind the wheel. You don't want to stay in that car. But we're, we are in that car. Do you think it's do you think it's more the problem that there's going to be humans trying to control the AI that um, are kind of I guess misguided or not not ethically sound, or do you th or do you think this endemic to an intelligence explosion is a high likelihood that AI will converge on some um, I guess strategy that will involve wiping humanity out or both? Well, I think the whole, the whole, uh, the most important consideration about the alignment problem is, you know, imagine, imagine all of the space of possible AIs. It's quite vast. You know, what, which one are we going to get? Uh, if we're extremely lucky, we'll get one that's that's benevolent to humans. But that benevolence won't, you know, if we pick that one, that the one that's benevolent to humans, that's a good thing. Hmm. Um, However, for it, for it to be benevolent to humans, we have to program that in. In fact, we have to program in more than benevolence. We have to really, you know, we have to we have to program in something that changes and grows with us. Something uh, Eliezer Yudkowsky calls uh, extrapolated coherent, coherent extrapolated volition. Coherent yeah. Volition. It's a, yeah, yeah. Right. It has to it has to be intuitive. It has to it has to grow with us. We don't want to be locked into the nor the moral norms of today. In a hundred years, you know, we we don't we, we want we want something that grows with us that that um, anticipates what we what's best for us without mm -hmm. being dictatorial. But we don't know anything about how to program benevolence into a machine. We don't know anything about how to pr program intuition into a machine. So, the the odds of that one. In the space of all possible AIs that are coming towards us, the odds of finding the one that's benevolent to us are extremely small. What's more likely is that we'll find uh, incredibly powerful AIs that are ambivalent about us, which is the same thing as extinction. 
mm-hmm. because they'll they'll do what they do. They'll 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 use resources. They'll 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 do uh, calculations. They'll they'll um, they'll act in their own in their own uh, in their own self interest. Mm-hmm. Uh, they won't they they won't be benign. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's um, I think that last time we spoke in depth about Steve Omohundo's basic AI drives. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, if anybody wants to find out more, I'll provide a link to the previous interview in the description. Um, but basically, it says that if we don't, if we're not careful, um, the AI may uh, have goals fall out of uh, its primary goal, whatever that may be, car manufacturing, paperclip manufacturing, getting into space. Um, and those sub goals would be anything like, a, you know, um, could be like just try and extract as much resources as possible. We're, we're made of resources. Or um, you know, uh, try and update its own source code to be more creative and and all those yeah. sorts of things. So yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, I think I think if anyone hasn't read Basic AI Drives, it's just it's such a good read and so logical. And um, that's he uses actually he uses rational agent economic theory to analyze the behavior of of uh, of super intelligent machines, and it's, it's it's quite fascinating, and quite and very and very compelling. Hmm. Um, you know, the so, history of technology is the history of unintended consequences. Right. And exactly. we're, we're, racing, we're racing into this future where, uh, where we don't know how, to, you know, this is why it's called a control problem. We don't know how to, how to anticipate the full scale of, of consequences. Right. There's a guy who wrote a book, um, and I had it written down somewhere, uh, that, that you often quote from. Yeah. It's, uh, what was it? Um, Normal, Normal Accidents. Accidents, normal yeah. accidents, yeah. yeah. Who's the author? Yeah, name? he's it's Charles Perrow, uh, P E R R O W, and it's a great book. It came out in the nineties, but he was talking about um, he was talking about very complex systems. Uh, if you have a system that's that's very very complex, then accidents are a normal part of its operation. And he was using um, Three Mile Island and Chernobyl and 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 airliners as examples. And we, you know, they occasionally airliners occasionally drop out of the sky. Um, Fukushima's happened, Chernobyl's happened, Three Mile Island's happened, but he, he analyzes uh, Chernobyl, and it was a series of events that you could not possibly anticipate. One crew went off duty, a sign, somebody put a sign in front of a, a, a red light that, you know, talked about, that was about a temperature gauge. Somebody did something else, and those three things in combination uh, created this gigantic environmental disaster that we still, that the region still hasn't recovered from. We don't know what it's done to our biosphere. Um, but it, but the, the, the important takeaway is when you design things that are, that are so incredibly complex, uh, having accidents is a normal part of the, of, of operating them. Now we know, I mean, mm-hmm. you, you've mentioned, um, the, the explainability problem that people are dealing with, with AI right now. We don't know. Yeah. We, we know <laughs> with neural nets, we know what the inputs are. We know what the outputs are. We know how to adjust the inputs to change the outputs. But we don't know at a high resolution way what's going on inside. Mm-hmm. It's a black box it's system. Opaque. Yeah. Yeah. It's a black box system, and so are so are um, neural nets, and so are evolutionary algorithms. Um, and there's a movement to uh, start over with a lot of programming and make it explainable throughout. And one of the reasons is. If you're driving a car and you have an accident, if you have a, if you're in a self-driving car and an accident happens, you need to know exactly how to apportion the blame. Hmm. You need to be able to really pinpoint that part of the code that, that steered you, steered you wrong, so to speak. Hmm. Um, just because of tort law, just because of how other systems operate. Hmm. Um, so we're, it, 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 it's the lesson of Charles Perrault is that we'll have accidents that we can't anticipate with with advanced cognitive architectures. Right. And some of these ac- um, accidents, if advanced cognitive architectures get even more powerful, could be quite extreme and arguably may actually lead to um, our extinction, um, you know, or extinction of, of all life in our biosphere. If we're mm-hmm. not careful, uh, if 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 these accidents involve a machine that is um, that doesn't actually have have a concern for us at all, 
It's just like a right. it doesn't have any understanding, doesn't have feeling, it doesn't have any um, form of like a, I guess to anthropomorphize things a little bit doesn't have empathy, right? <laughs> if I right. can use that term. Um, sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, so if yeah, so do you want to talk about what could happen if we, you know, if we have a, an extremely powerful uh, optimizer that uh, doesn't have this sort of inbuilt benevolence as you described it before? Well, and an accident I, I, happens. Yeah, well, uh, according to Amahundro, um, the basic drives. I mean, no matter what the the, the software is, is designed for, it will be useful for it to have enough resources to run. It will be against its programming to not be able to run. And we're talking about very sophisticated systems, um, so it will, it will try to get it will try to get resources, um, mm -hmm. and it will try to guard resources. It won't want to be unplugged because being unplugged. Yes is the most severe damage to its uh to its um objective to its goal to its goal, goal seeking to its, to yeah. its exactly to its utility function to, to yeah, its yeah. Goals, Go seeking. goals sound more like easier to understand i use these terms but i just yeah i think yeah most people understand goals <laughs> rather than just yeah objective. it's a goal seeking instead of utility utility functions again from rational agent economic theory um it will it'll be creative, so it will want, it'll it'll always be trying to anticipate how to better increase its chances of achieving its goals. And one of the things it will do quite naturally uh, is try to try to understand and develop artificial intelligence research and it, 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 try to improve its own code. It will it'll try it'll it'll be uh, at some point will this 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 uh, cognitive architecture will be self aware enough. To have a model of itself in the environment it's it's in, and it will want to improve its own its own ability to achieve its goals, i.e., its intelligence. Mm -hmm. So it will become a a programmer. It will become it will become uh, capable of doing artificial intelligence research and development. And then you've got, as we said a minute ago, you've got the formula for the intelligence explosion. Then its intelligence increases very rapidly. Mm. So just creating a goal-oriented machine of uh, that's 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 uh, at the level where it's self-aware and self-improving is sets up the intelligence explosion. Hmm. We may end up with um, an alien-like intelligence that is completely yeah. different from ours. That um, is a black box. We don't understand. It may not even understand itself. Um, it's just extremely powerful, right? Mm -hmm. In the same way as we can see. Uh, systems today that that are hugely complex are uh, like a massive but still are uh, uh, extremely complex very alien to our, us they don't think like us they don't behave like us but they do things extremely powerfully they they uh, solve problems quickly um, they do sorting and searching rather fast and you know they're excellent at um, calculations and, and things like that so image recognition voice recognition it's it's the same yeah they thing. have they have they have what you know if you if you pulled someone pulled someone out of uh you know the 19th century and showed them these these capabilities they'd say they were godlike or they were superhuman yeah just just the ones you've gone through just just the stuff that we we call routine now um you bring them all together into a general intelligence and you've got something that's that's godlike mm -hmm. you've got something that's just awesomely powerful if you imagine you know, uh, we're, we we had a there's a big insight with artificial neural nets. What what Gary Marcus says has to happen now. Gary Marcus, the AI maker and thinker, mm -hmm. is we need some, we need an insight about common sense. Mm -hmm. We need we need you know we need uh, an insight about uh, a system that can learn about the world and develop an ontology, a common sense database. So it can mm -hmm. so it can. It knows that you can cup your hands, or you can pour from a cup, or you know there's under you can you can go under the table or over the table. You can do things in the physical world, and there are people that are working on this hard right now. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, there's there used to be a, there used to be more. There was one called Psych. That yeah, was, that's uh, right. So there's I, one called yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, some people say that's a cataclysmic failure because all they were doing was adding axioms and they thought that maybe once they reach a million, intelligence would emerge and now they're up to many millions and still 
betting mole. Well, I, I think I think what, what's they, they I think they wrote them in uh, they wrote them in um, in a mathematical form. I think all it t- all it's going to take. I I don't think it's a waste of time. I think all it's going to take is a. Waste a, of time is a I, I think I think the, all it's going to take is a cut is some architecture that understands it, that can that can translate that into into uh, into like into that can they can understand like um, the, there's a, there's a couple of others there's a Nell never ending language learning I'm not sure how that's doing anymore mm-hmm. I'm not sure if that's program still online mm-hmm. but if we had if you had immense uh, cognitive power and then you added added an insight about about common sense about 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 knowledge hmm. like that you you have you could have you could bring all those different capabilities together into a general intelligence mm-hmm. yeah i agree i think one of the a couple of people are talking about um causative ai that's causal learning structures in ai and it's not just about you, you you're a bayesian thinker um as a as a bayesianist myself i've been involved in creating bayesian nets um, mm. And they're they're very good, but um and and their causative structures you got this acyclic graph that sort of um updates itself when you know you 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 change a certain thing over here um and and, and something over there changes in response and so it's got these this sort of flow of causation going through it. Mm. Uh, but the problem is, in order to achieve that, you need to elicit expertise. Um, and program that into the model, into the network yourself. You need the under, you need the human understanding to build the actual model, to create the this, and then it's it's very powerful um, for that very narrow field that it's uh, mm. built for. But um, at the moment, people like uh, Yosha ben- Bengio, who mm-hmm. was one of the pioneers in deep learning, definitely worth talking to if you got a chance, and also Judea Pearl, who's very like a yeah. guru in uh, yeah. Bayesian nets. They're talking about causal AI, and my awesome. intuition is that once we figure out causal AI, that'll um, have a lot of downstream impacts in the the power how powerful AI can get. It it may become it'll be able to answer more why questions. You'll be able to do more with less data, and so mm-hmm. this is in contrast to what AI is doing at the moment, which is um, doing mass correlations across massive amounts of data. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, look, I'm not saying it's the only I will, thing that I will definitely, result, but, no, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm behind on that. I'll have to look, I'll have to look into that. You know, it does seem, it does seem that we're like one or two big insights away from general, yes. you know, artificial general intelligence and, and mm-hmm. Might not be all that uh, far away. It really it could happen. Yeah, I don't, I, it's, it's hard. I wonder, you know, Ray Kurzweil used to write, and I don't know if he still believes this, but by 2029, he says $1,000 of computing will get you human-level intelligence in a machine. Uh, so 2029 yeah, was his... human his brain day. power, yeah, in a machine. Yeah, yeah. Correct. yeah. And Which by 2045. A, <laughs> well, he, he said 2045 was super intelligence, I think. Mm, that's 2029, right. you get you get human level intelligence. I'm not sure why there's such a giant gap. He's a s- slow mm. takeoff guy on, on the intelligence explosion. Mm. Um, I'm not sure why it would take that long for for gives us a long yeah, grace to period to up. sort of work out the kinks and make sure it's benevolent, huh? Well, yeah. you know, I, I I don't know. I that would be nice to have, but I, I'm not sure. I don't think that's gonna. I don't think it's gonna work out that way. Mm. That's right. I agree. I mean, look, once once an AI does get to a certain level of intelligence, human level of intelligence, it's not going to be bound by the cognitive limitations that we have. We're skull bound. We can't just plug yeah. directly into a machine. And our um, the bandwidth which we have to actually communicate with a machine is rather low. Yeah. I mean, it's through our fingers and through our voice and through our eyes. Imagine um, a machine that could copy insight. Right, you've got like a, you've got this architecture yeah. where you could have many AIs, but like one of them makes a breakthrough, then all of them gain that insight. Like you have one Einstein, then all of them yeah. becomes an Einstein. Right? <laughs> yeah, and that's that's I think the the beauty of training uh, training infant AIs in virtual worlds is that once you've done, once you've given an AI a high resolution understanding of the world through a virtual world, then you let, let them out into the real world and you you know and put them in a embody him. You know, some people firmly believe that you can't you'll never have real intelligence without embodiment. So then you take that 
that creature from the virtual world, you put it in a body and have it learn about the real world, you only have to do that once because then it shares it with the other the other robots. Hmm. It shares that hmm. with the other other intelligences. Um, yeah. People have been talking about raising uh, raising infant AIs for a long time. I'm not sure where that stands right now. Who's doing that? That kind of relates to an interview I did recently with Stephen Harned, who came up with the symbol grounding problem. And this has mm. been an issue with AI. How is it mm. that our symbols, I mean, it's also been elucidated in the Chinese room argument there. How is it that our symbols, these like, um, you know, in our head, um, gain some sort of like a meaning? How is it what with the fire in the equations? And he thinks that it's got something to do with our multimodal experience of the world through our sensor motor like um, apparatuses, our, our eyes, our fingers, our ability to see, experience, and also manipulate the world. So this gives us a very rich um, form of experience. We attach to um, this dictionary of, or at least in the core of this dictionary of, the, uh, of all these symbols we have floating around in our head. Um, and so mm. all we need is a certain amount of them to be grounded and then that gives um, us more of a rich sense of meaning than what an AI, uh, just mm -hmm. simple processing AI would be able to get. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's that that could be uh, one of the one of the problems that needs to be solved in order to achieve truly uh, a machine that can really understand or, or, de or derive meaning from anything. At the moment, um, I, as far as that's, I understand, yeah. the AIs may give us meaning, but it doesn't have any sort of internal meaning. Um, in the in the, are they, I guess in the understanding sense of the word. No, but that's it sounds like another. That's really fascinating. It sounds like another argument for embodied AI. Uh, yes, that's right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, I guess arguably, if the AI was um, was existing in a very rich uh, virtual world, it may be able to um, obtain some form of like a symbol grounding as long as the inputs weren't just text alone yeah it was visual uh, it was um you know tactile it was uh, yeah like yeah like they could hear it there was many arguably you know if if symbol grounding is is part of what gives us meaning then an ai uh properly endowed with even more sensor sensory motor capabilities than us could have but maybe a, a wider wider bandwidth for meaning like you know imagine you know like a, it could do um echolocation mm -hmm. like a bat mm. can uh or, or ah. be able to sort of um pick up on electro signatures like some fish can um, why not why not yeah, yeah. if you made it sufficiently uh <laughs> if you made it sufficiently um a high enough resolution virtual world you could give it all kinds of of, of abilities but it's also a safety mechanism it's a way to sandbox the ai so yes you know if it's in a virtual world it's probably not going to be able to escape uh, you know although as soon as i say that i, I think of all the all the ways that it could escape <laughs> yeah yeah did, are, are you, did you watch the film um deuce ex Mach machina yes uh, i did the, uh, i did yeah yeah, yeah. i it liked it about uh, the problem yeah, but it was. I liked it um, because it had the you know it had an, an AI that had this just giant giant desire to escape, hmm. and you know we know. I mean, it's it's even. I, I think that we'll we'll discover that even synthetic life has that giant desire to escape, mm -hmm. um, and 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 not be confined. But what I, the only thing I didn't like about it was that here's a here's a lone genius mm -hmm. who solved robotics and AI at the same I time. Know. By himself, that's a, that's you know mm. one or the other is is science fiction. Two mm. is just mm. kind of a little, a little too far out. But I, I like the I like the promise. It was it was the uh, AI Vox experiment. Yeah, yeah. Well, I did like that film. Um, we got to see. It. I, I actually organised an event. The only cinema in in Victoria which was showing it, and I'm quite surprised it didn't really make it to the big screens in 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 Australia. It was a very well, good did. film and probably one of the most philosophically informed films I've seen about AI, even more yeah. so than 2001 A Space Odyssey, in my opinion. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's tough. That was, that I know was, it is tough, but yeah, uh, it was, it was, 
yeah, it was it was philosophically informed. You know, there are layers of two thousand and one that you know people will be unpeeling for a long time. Yeah. Um, oh, it's fantastic. I, I was, film. Yeah, I, I got to interview uh, Arthur C. Clarke about that years ago. Hmm. And that's where you know his whole he he how he created the HAL nine thousand the original homicidal robot or one of the original homicidal robots, and he introduced a lot of the issues that we think about still, um, like the AI box experiment, like you know how do you, how do you confine intelligence? Hmm. Uh, ultimately, intelligence gets outsmarted, or an intelligent machine gets outsmarted, but it's also ridiculously homicidal. Hmm. Um, in that movie. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. It's it's interesting to think about that the uh, the impacts of different types of intelligence on um, I guess any problem we, we we throw at it, but also the problem of our own survival. Uh, and I mentioned to you like before the interview about this idea that machine in, intelligence could be used, um, especially machine understanding could be used to actually help solve the the AI friendliness problem. It's a bit controversial, hmm. and I'm not saying it, we should do it, but I think it's something that's probably worth exploring as a as a you know um, a, yeah. a potential problem to be solved. Because, well, for instance, the value loading problem is how do you get value into an AI? Yeah, if the AI doesn't understand the value, um, it could misinterpret the value, and you you may end up seeding a value inside of an AI that gets perversely instantiated like for instance you know you take tell an ai you want to be rich and you want everything that you touch turn to gold <laughs> <laughs> yeah and the ai it takes you literally and and all your food and your relatives get turned to gold yes. and then yes. you die Which, and so do that's it, that's it. your relatives well you know i mean if you if you create something that's truly intelligent it, it has it, it knows things about context and it knows things about mm -hmm. and it's and it's it's read about it's read about midas it's you know it's it knows culturally what that what you're mm -hmm. the things to avoid um yes. but yeah. what you mentioned before uh steve Mahundro again is a big proponent of the scaffolding yes. uh approach so you build as you said you use ai to help you build ai to mm -hmm. a certain level Hmm. as a scaffold and then you build another ai to get to get the ai to a certain point and then and you stop again and you just make sure everything's safe hmm. and and no ai has the ability to 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 be, become a runaway intelligence to to if, if you do it slowly and incrementally and what it is is it's it's a way to not have a hard takeoff in the in the, in the intelligence explosion mm -hmm. yeah 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 it's, yeah, a way it's to fascinating avoid. Um, yeah, one of the things that, like, some understandings, like, are difficult to achieve. Like, for instance, we, we, we achieve the understanding that um, we, we actually circulate around the sun. But it took a long time for us to do that. But once we oh, yeah. got the idea, now it's relatively easy to digest. <laughs> mm -hmm. So some Except understandings, that, yeah. like, are difficult to actually get to, but once achieved, they're easy to digest. Um, and so we get like natural selection is another one, um, yeah. and that the idea that bacteria can cause disease, AI safety may be like a problem like that, where without the aid of machine intelligence, it may be a we may find it's a, a problem that's too hard to crack um, before we actually achieve super intelligence. So maybe like this scaffolding problem. Maybe on the path to superintelligence, we can use varying degrees of AI um, with varying degrees of understanding to help us solve AI safety issues. I, I, I think don't that's, think it's I, infallible, but yeah. It's no, I think that's a, that's a, that's a, I think whoever had that insight, I mean, that insight is really, really powerful and really, really important. And for Luddites like me, it's very scary, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it, but maybe the next generation of people thinking about right. these problems will, will say, well, you know, what we really need to do is put this mm. in the hands of the kind of program that solved the protein folding problem. Mm. Like, how do we, how do we create a, uh, an AI that's, that's, whose values are aligned with ours and stay aligned with ours over time? Mm. Um, it seems, I mean, it still seems to be such an insurmountable problem when we know so little about imbuing uh, 
AI with 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 any sort of value. Yeah. In, in, in fact, it's we're, we're you know, unfortunately, we're talking about something that we we have no real cognitive architecture to try it on. Hmm. Um, we can talk about it and talk about it, but we have to get up to a certain point of intelligence before these a lot of these conversations become really meaningful. At that point, we need supervision, and general principles of ethics and safety are not going to be enough. But we're in this predicament because I think we all believe that unless we're hit by an asteroid, we're going we're marching steadily towards artificial general intelligence and then super intelligence. Hmm. Um, you know, people, people, a lot of us think this is really inevitable. This is the path we're on. Hmm. Uh, but the but the the paradox is, at some point, it's going to be become incredibly dangerous, and hmm. uh, we we need new ideas about how to solve that because we're not getting that far. Uh, maybe and maybe those ideas will not come from us. Maybe they'll come from from an AI. Yeah, um, I guess much like drones, it, it it's important to keep humans in the loop. <laughs> Um, and I wouldn't, you know, uh, like I, I'm not a big fan of automated warfare. I think you've spoken about that in other conversations as well. Um, yeah. it can get rather dangerous. Um, I used to, I used to think when, when I, when I thought, when I thought about the ramp up problems to AI, I didn't think about cognitive bias. I didn't think about, um, a, a lot of things that are happening now. I didn't think about all the privacy issues, you know, who has the right to your face, who owns your face? Hmm. Well, Palantir, the, the American company, thinks they own your face because they're developing uh, facial recognition systems that are going to be used in public places. Um, China, and if you're if you're Chinese, the Chinese think they own your face because they're using facial recognition technology to imprison a million Uyghurs in Western China. Um, so mm -hmm. there, there we have, we have a, there there are a lot of issues right now with AI. I used to think. I used to think the biggest problem was 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 battlefield robots and drones, um, but in the, in the intervening seven years since I finished since the book came out, my book, our, our final invention came out, um, problems have introduced themselves that we just nobody anticipated that we mm -hmm. just didn't think about, mm -hmm. and more are going to more will come, will mm -hmm. be and and more and they'll they'll require a great deal of attention as well. Are you thinking of doing a, an updated version or a new book, a revised yeah, version? Yeah, I, I, I am. I am. I tell you, I'm so I'm busy with films and. Uh, oh, absolutely. And so, so but I do I do want to do an updated book, and it will be about the, it'll be about the intelligence explosion. It'll mm -hmm. be about uh, what are we what are we doing to mitigate it? Who's in charge? Why they why they can or can't be trusted? What's mm -hmm. the role of what's the role of uh, regulation? And then what, what, what are the kind of, uh, what parallels can we draw? Because we can't, we have to argue by analogy with some of these things because we can't, you know, we, we don't, or, or analogy and thought experiments hmm. because we, we can't, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. But um, we have had some technological screw-ups that are, that have close similarities to what's happening now with AI. Nuclear hmm. fission is one of them. Hmm. Um, you know, the technology that almost, made us extinct several times and, and still may yeah um so if you think that if you think yeah. that at one point there were seventy thousand nuclear uh warheads mm -hmm. between uh, among all the countries seventy thousand it's a miracle that we didn't destroy ourselves and and it seems uh, that we came close many times yes and we're still not out of the woods i mean by accident right? north korea yeah north korea is just you know they're just plowing away with their psychopathic plans um so there so yeah yeah that's what I, i'd like to focus on on the, the 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 impending intelligence explosion how to mitigate it who's in charge why they shouldn't be trusted absolutely sounds like a fantastic topic <laughs> have you uh, are you familiar with nick bostrom's paper on the vulnerable world hypothesis you know, I, 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 because I saw it in your notes, I looked, started to look into it, and I've, I've printed it out, and I'm looking forward to reading it. Oh, definitely it's, worth a read. I'll just, yeah, I'll just, just leave that as a, as a highlight. Oh, I don't want to. You know, spoil, I'm really I looking forward to it. For I, I, I looked at the abs, the abstract, and it reminds me a little bit of um, <clears throat> the, the concept of, uh, you know, uh, looking at, looking at all possible AIs. 
Mm-hmm. You know, some are black balls and some are white balls. Oh yes, yeah. But, yep. but if we pull, if we pull a black, and all yeah, if you, if you, uh, in the space of all possible AIs that we might create, hmm. um, some of them will be black balls and some will be white balls. And people say, well, you know, we're, we'll be there. We'll be, we'll be, we'll be making it ourselves. We won't make any black balls. But you know, we half of the things we do, half the things we make, are accidents before they're successes. Hmm. Or involve accidents before they're successes. Hmm. Um, hmm. You know, no technology is flawless. No technology doesn't result in uh, some cat- 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 catastrophe. But AI, unfortunately, is in a category of of, of uh, technology where some catastrophes aren't survivable. Mm-hmm. I wanted to bring this up before. It probably would have been a good stage setting, but I'll bring it up now anyway. And that's this seeming asymmetry of worry. Um, and positivity about AI. Why should we worry more about the possibility of AI than we, um, you know, chuck a party and sing kumbaya about the possibilities of AI? I mean, it, it's great to talk about the possibilities. We we didn't really cover that at all. Um, we didn't cover the you know the the um, the astronomical waste argument or the the idea that or, of cosmological endowment or anything like that but uh, why should we be more concerned about the possible downsides of AI well <clears throat> because um, and I, I'm somewhat familiar with the argument you know we make we make things that out, cars that outrun us but they don't kill us we make you know hot fires that don't always roast us uh, why should we make thinking machines that don't don't that may not kill us um, the, the, it has to do with with the nature of, of intelligence. Intelligence is qualitatively different from every other te- every other technology. Um, we could find ourselves in the presence of some very rapidly of something we just don't understand, and then we'll be very very vulnerable in a way that we're not vulnerable to other technologies. So it's qualitatively different. It's, in a, it's a different category. Um, when we when we we you know, it's like a. a in, a, in, in my dog understands maybe five percent of what I say and and fifty percent of what I do. Well, maybe five percent, ten percent of what I do. But there's giant worlds of things he'll never grasp. And you know, every day, I, every day we jump in the car, I could be taking him to the vet to have him put down. Uh, but bec- and th- th- that's that's the nature of the 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 the, ve- the difference in our intel in our intelligence. Um, it's it's an intellectual superiority that I have over my dog. Uh, something with intellectual superiority is, is as Arthur C. Clarke said, we steer the future because of our intelligence, not because of our strength. When it, whatever whatever is more intelligent than we are will steer, steer the future. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's that it's that it's the un, unknown unknowns. It's the things we can't understand. Uh, that, that and we seem to be embracing it as fast as we can. Mm. In a period when, when we when we cease to understand the technology we've created. A lot of what drives our enthusiasm for just adopting these sorts of things is the near term possibilities of AI, or the the new things it can allow our sort of phones to do, for instance, or or mm-hmm. for instance, if there's a new feature. <laughs> <laughs> that, I love my I about. love my don't don't touch my phone don't take my phone away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But well, that's, what pe- that's, yeah. people often don't think about is the long-term possibility of AI. And I just brought this up briefly. What are we missing out of if we muck this up, right? If we don't get um, properly aligned artificial intelligence, if we don't have artificial intelligence will coordinate with us, um, we don't solve the, the friendliness problem, uh, we miss out on, like, you know, what's physically possible. We could list so much space out there, right? There's this, um, like this astronomical amount of stuff out there in the universe that could be purposed to achieve great things. Yeah. I mean, well, we, yeah, it's, uh, we don't, if we, if we, if we're, you know, we're, this is another way of looking at the great filter. Is the great filter mm-hmm. behind us or is it ahead of us? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe, maybe intelligent species never get beyond this. Maybe they create something. Maybe they create machines that are smarter than them, and then they then they then they vanish, mm-hmm. or, or or the biological ones vanish, and then maybe the, as I said in our final invention, maybe the other 
the, the, the technology that survives goes off to find it goes off to find another part of the universe. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, uh, if we miss out on this, on the intelligence explosion, if we miss out on this moment and we do it wrong, as, as, uh, as others have said, we don't, it's, we don't just kill ourselves. We kill all the generations that could come ahead of us. Exactly. So the pressure is really on to get this right. Uh, unlike any other time in human history, we've never had, except maybe a little bit with nuclear fission, we've never had a moment where we had to get cool heads together and, uh, and, and, and come up with solutions. But, you know, we are driven and corporations are the people in charge, unfortunately, are driven by qu the quarterly report. They're, they're, they're driven by profits. They're driven by competition and by, you know, you know, buying up competing companies and crushing them. Um, they're not, there's no dividend to saving humanity to them. Uh, it, it, the corporations have, have been doing this forever. I mean, how, w w what better evidence do you need than the fact that, you know, our, our consumerism and our corporations have just are, just are actively destroying the biome we live in hmm. as fast as they can, you know, it's not enough now to plant trees. It's not enough now to, 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 to not burn trees. We can't, we can't solve our carbon problem by taking normal measures. And we don't know how to solve our, our carbon sequestration problem. Um, and who, and what got us here? Well, we did our, our consumerism, our, our paying attention to the, to the quarterly profit report, um, worshiping that God, uh, so we've got to, you know, this, this, this moment requires us to look deep, 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 deep inside ourselves. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So what can people do? I mean, what can people do to help mitigate the, the risk of, um, an unfriendly outcome of an intelligence explosion? Well, you know, I, I, I think that, it? you know, uh, the candidate Wang, I believe his name is Wang, uh, promised to start an AI cabinet position to talk about AI regulation. And I think what you can do is vote for candidates who have AI on their agenda, who know what these issues are. That's the most concrete thing. <clears throat> get involved. If your candidate doesn't have AI on his agenda, AI risk, then get another candidate or write to your candidate and say, listen, this is really important to me. Mm -hmm. um, that's what just for, you know, that's what most people can do. Uh, we can vote. We can we can push for AI regulation, mm -hmm. and it's you know it's in a way it's happening anyway right now with the uh, potential breakup as monopolies of Facebook and Google, or Alphabet. Mm -hmm. um, that's one way to approach it: uh, break these companies up, make them less profitable, and then subject them to more more scrutiny. Uh, it's really it's it, I, to me it's it's. All the all the ethics organizations in the world are not going to are not going to stop the giant juggernaut of these companies. Um, they just don't have the money. They don't have the influence. We need we need we need government. We need unfortunately we need politicians. Hmm. We need Capitol Hill the, in America, you know, and we need it everywhere. I mean, the IAEA is an international organization. We need an international organization to monitor AI. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's enough AI safety researchers out there now that was different maybe seven years ago? Oh my God. It, you can't park your car without running over an AI researcher. <laughs> <laughs> AI safety researcher. Oh uh, yes. Also, um, you know, and Google had a, had a great one. They just fired her. Uh, you know, uh, what, what a, what a, what a chump move that was. Um, I think, you know, I don't know if AI, if being an AI researcher, I don't know if we need more AI, AI safety researchers. I, I really don't know. I, you know, I just don't know. I, I don't have an answer for that. I think more is not necessarily better. It's like, do we need another organization dedicated to AI safety? I'm not sure we need another one. Hmm. I think we need to pay attention to the, to the, to the, to the bunches we have and make sure they're actually doing their jobs. I don't have any faith. You know, Google said they're setting up an AI ethics group and and I have any I have zero faith that they'll follow what they what what 
the ethics group comes comes up with. That, it's 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 very obviously to, to me it's very obviously uh, window dressing. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know this is where this is where the uh, the friendly force of government would have to come in. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, um, yes, if, if, uh, it's been wonderful speaking to you. I've got um, plenty of material here, but is there anything that I haven't uh, brought up which you'd like to mention at this stage? Like, is it- no, I think uh, you've made me think about I'm, I'm really going to look up uh, um, a couple of the things you've mentioned. You've made me think about some things. But no, I haven't got Glad. anything else. <laughs> no, that's good. I, did, um, I, I've, I, I spent so much time filmmaking, I... I I can't keep up with everything in AI, but I need to. I need to. Uh, I need to. Um, yeah. Re, yeah. Yeah. Re, re, reinvigorate myself. I mean, if regarding the technical problem of solving uh, artificial, uh, sorry, friendly intelligence or um, AI safety, mm-hmm. there's a, there's a technical problem. There's a sociological problem. I think AI may be able to help. Um, with both if you could, if you cast a sociological problem as uh, a separate thing than actually how to program an AI to be safe um, yeah. then yeah I think maybe uh, levels or different types of AI coming in to help us understand but also it being able to understand itself and in a sense um, I think that it may be where AI is heading if we do if, if there's enough market force to uh, to yearn for a causative AI, a causal learning AI, then that mm-hmm. may be extremely interesting and may change the way that we approach AI safety from a technical standpoint. But maybe also as a coordination problem, uh, these all sort of, I'm not absolutely sure on these, I, I just think that they're totally worth exploring. But I'm really interested to, to know whether you're going to be bringing out a documentary on uh, these subjects as well sometime in the future yeah that that's uh, it's hard these are it's hard to this is not a visual uh, me, visual subject it's very very hard to mm. do um mm. i've taken part in a couple and uh it's just it's very hard you know in a documentary like i'm, I'm developing a couple of documentaries right now you get about uh in two hours you get about eight thousand words mm. that's about as much as you get in a long chapter of a book mm. so I would have made a documentary about this a long time ago, um, and many people have asked me why I haven't. Because, it, but I just can't make an argument in eight thousand words. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't. I, this is too complicated. It, it's 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 not the right format for 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 AI. Documentary is not the right format. Mm-hmm. You could you could you can impart emotion about it. You can impart an introduction to these these issues. But yeah. I'm not sure you can make a really complete a complete film or a fair treatment. And then right. the d- danger is you you trivialize it by making it by making it incomplete. Hmm. Um, so it's hard. And I, I I've sometimes uh, even a, a feature film like it like like um, do, like Ex Machina is a better thing to do because it 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 it, it brings out the emotional core of the problem. And uh, then lets people reflect on it. Um, I would be more interested in writing another book because in a mm-hmm. book you've got ninety thousand words. You know, mm-hmm. you've got a lot more room to play with, mm-hmm. a lot more people to interview, a lot more avenues to to, to travel down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. That's fascinating. I kind of agree with you. Although the spectrum of people that you're going to address with a book is different from those that are watching Netflix. Um, yes. And when, when it comes to people voting, uh, it, the, the people who vote uh, may not actually be reading books. They, a lot of them are just watching Netflix. <laughs> you know, I have to say, as soon as this, these words came out of my mouth, the documentary wouldn't do it. I think of, um, I think of uh, An Inconvenient Truth. Yes. And you know, uh, I, I, the 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 um, environmental movement was in kind of a backwater until that movie. That movie made it really move the needle. Hmm. Somebody should you know give Al Gore another prize. Um, hmm. I think he won an Oscar for that. And that hmm. and he did it in a in a in a 
fairly short film. It was a really kind of a slideshow. Um, mm -hmm. And he did it in a concise, powerful way. So maybe there is a way to, uh, maybe there is a way to make a powerful short film about, about AI risk. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been done yet. I haven't been impressed by, uh, by those that have come out yet. Right, yeah. I did watch um, Should We Trust This Machine or This Computer. Yeah, I thought that's the best of those that have happened so far. But mm, it's one of them. I feel like yeah, it was... I thought it was... Yeah it, didn't, yeah, it didn't seem to have, like, an overall purpose. I didn't detect it anyway. Um, no, I, I, it think the, I think the... Uh, I know the filmmaker, and I think he was compromised by a lot of different interests in that film. And, uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, that's true. But he's a great, he's a great filmmaker. Sure, yeah. Well, yeah, it's been wonderful chatting to you. Um, well, great to you. see you again, Adam. It's been, yeah. uh, it was, it's funny that seven years have slipped by. It, yeah, um, it's happened pretty quickly, but it's been pretty, pretty exciting in the world of AI. It um, sure has. Yeah. Um, it's been a, it's been a, uh, it's been a whirlwind. I, I, I feel like I was part of a, um, a uh, zeitgeist that, mm -hmm. you know, the world was waking up to these issues. Hmm. And our final invention was part of that waking up, and then a bunch of other books, and then this whole uh, proliferation of organizations. It's just, I think, I think most of it has been great. Hmm. Hmm. I hope we don't. I hope. It, I hope so many organizations and ethics boards come out that it doesn't trivialize it. Hmm. <clears throat> you know, I think that at some point it's just this. It's this this herd effect where there's a lot of noise and not a lot of, you know, insight. Hmm. But true. yeah, well, might, great to talk to you, Adam. Too sexy to 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 sort of to take seriously, right? <laughs> well, it becomes this. It, it, you know, I think that if there's too much too much chatter about it, the smart chatter won't come forward. You know, the smart ideas won't get out. You know, there'll be a lot of committees. Hmm. Interesting. So. Hmm. Wow, plenty well, to think I, about. As long as there's AI and we're still alive, there'll be plenty to think about. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, thanks everybody for watching, and um, please subscribe to this channel if you have not already, and uh, let your friends know about it. And also um, check out James James's book, which I'll definitely put a description uh, a, a link to in the description there. So, and also James has got plenty of documentaries and has got a host of work. So check out his Wikipedia page as well. And also jamesbarrett.com, wasn't it? Yep. Yes. Jamesbarrett.com. Cool. Thank All you, right. Adam. My pleasure. All right. Take Speak care. Thanks. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.